uh, have this opportunity. So um, uh, we are, again, looking forward to it. So I'll be short on the introduction here because, again, we want to get to your uh, your questions and your comments. This will, this will be the comment mm -hmm. aisle over here and the, uh, the question aisle here. The format has worked well so far. We've had one in uh, uh, March down in uh, Grass Valley and then one in April in Oroville and one in April in uh, Reading was to do two one minute comments and then one one minute or so question with a, a response by me there. That works pretty well. And just so you know, we are timed in Congress as well, so it's not like we're trying to tell everybody how long you have. It's just more opportunity for more people to have their comments or questions uh, uh, run through here, and um, so so we're not any different than what the rules are really for Congress on the timeline as well. So with that, I imagine healthcare is going to be a topic today. Yeah. So uh, we, uh, as, as we know, the House of Representatives uh, sent a bill over to the Senate. And the Senate has uh, chosen to go in a different direction with that bill. They could have either taken that bill and modified it slightly, or they came up with one of their own. Well, they weren't able to move one out of the Senate. Some people are happy, some people aren't happy about that. But uh, that doesn't say that, um, that, that doesn't mean the problem of health care, health insurance in this country, and how it's going to be paid for, how it's going to be handled, has gone away. We still have gigantic issues with how the ACA is playing out. And so the, the problems are still there. And the Senate, having recessed for most of August, uh, has not found a way to, to deal with it on that side. But we will have to. Here's some of the things we're dealing with is that the premiums are still soaring for people that are paying that. <coughs> Networks are getting narrower. Yeah. Providers are still losing money. And they're pulling out of the markets. We just saw that with Anthem. They have 19 regions of Anthem covers in California. They pulled out of 16 of them just the other day. We're still fortunate Anthem will be one of our choices here in the Northern California area and then two other regions that they have in the Bay Area. But that's about it. And what we're, what we're seeing is that the folks, the young and healthy individuals, are still not signing up for coverage unless they're forced to by the penalty. If they don't apply, if they don't qualify for the hardship, there's a lot of people that are involuntarily buying, being forced to buy what the federal government is providing. So we talk about, you know, what the uh, CBO is saying, like, well, 24 million people will be off health care. Well, approximately 17 million of them will be off because they want to be off. They don't want to have that health insurance because they're being forced to. They're being forced into it by a mandate or a penalty. They choose to either get into a program or they get a penalty. So many of those are off. And so what, is, what else is flawed with the CBO reports you're hearing is that the CBO doesn't reflect all three phases of what the House has been working on in the whole health care, uh, health insurance debate. We knew the first bill wasn't going to be the be-all, end-all, but because of the constraints of the, the, uh, the process of uh, budget reconciliation where the Senate, in order to um, uh, pass a bill with 51 votes, we've had to follow that procedure and then hand it off to the Senate to do it their way from there. It was also phase two was the Secretary of Health, Tom Price, would have much discretion as the bill was set up. Indeed, the bill was passed with giving the Secretary broad powers over 800 different aspects of decisions the Secretary could make. But that wasn't taken into account by CBO, so you hear numbers that aren't really in line with that authority, as well as the third phase, of, of legislation after those are put in place, which will require 60 votes, such as portability of being able to buy insurance policies across state lines and many other aspects that uh, would make more choices for people instead of the federal government deciding what your choices are. So we can get into that. Um, what we're after, what I'm after, you know, there's a lot of misperception about this, is that we really want to give the insurance choices back to the people. Government doesn't give it anyway. We need to get government out of the way of people being able to provide that. Okay? Let them have the control of their health care. Let them have their choices. You know, we all like choices, right? In rural California, a lot of rural America, you might have one or two choices of a plan. We see those dropping. As we see in Dallas California just a few days ago, statewide, after a 13% rate increase last year, it's going to be a statewide 12% increase 
Now, and when you break it up to region, we're going to be <laughs> lucky enough in Northern California, rural California, to have a 33% increase in rains. Now, is this working, folks? No. Can you honestly ask yourself, Lobbyists, you say. Lobby, lobbyists, you say. Greedy insurance companies. So now, I'm not a guy that really cares a whole lot about what the corporate world says. I when I talk about being pro business, I mean the kind of business that we all do the benefits of the public. Free enterprise. So when I see corporate America hiding, taking positions on issues and, and, and not being not being bold with what really needs to be done, they, they look at they look at the market and they decide, well what's good for our market? And that's really it's really not what we need to have happening in policy. So I look at what is the best policy for the people. And what I've seen on this is that what I've seen on this is that people across the board are, are being hurt by this. Even the folks that are getting the assistance are going to run out of choices. They're going to run out of assistance because this is an unsustainable path of cost, with, uh, especially with Medicaid. Medicaid, when a doctor, a doctor gets paid $22 per visit, can decide how much charity can I do and still keep my office running. Same goes with clinics. Same goes with hospitals. How much can they afford? Then the burden shifts back to other people that can pay in their insurance. Okay, so the burden has shifted. There's no free lunch on this thing. So what do we need to do more so what the ACA missed the mark on was controlling costs. Doing things to make the cost of doing business less. Whether it's liability insurance and lawsuits or all the other things that drive up the cost of running an office, running a hospital. You know, I got the mic, folks, okay? Thank you. Hey. So we're going to go to your questions in a moment, but if we want to have a positive interaction, if you want to do any more of these, then we need to be having constructive conversation. Tell that to the president. Entire first district, not this. Okay. Entire first district. So that's it. Why don't we go ahead and start with a question right here? Yay! And we'll have again. Uh, our man down here will be given uh, the warning on that. The yellow means what? 15 seconds. And then the red means the minute's over. In order to be fair to the most possible people. Thank you. Okay. Hi. I appreciate you being here to listen. Thank you. This is a picture of my son. Um, he loved riding horses, playing golf, and um, playing John Frank folk songs on his guitar. His birthday is in a, about 10 days on August 18th. Um, unfortunately, he's not here to celebrate his birthday. Um, he died in 2015 from an opioid overdose. That same year, over 50,000 Americans died of drug overdoses. 1,242 of those deaths were in our district, District 1. My question to you has to do with health care and the opioid crisis. The health care bill that you voted for, the HACA, would discontinue health insurance for millions of people. It would dramatically increase premiums for people over 50. But probably the scariest thing is it, all, it strips away the essential benefits that cover preventative care and um, drug treatment and mental health treatment. I want you to know that these are life and death decisions you are making. I don't have my beautiful son anymore. Um, okay, ma'am, our, our, our time. Thank you for that. Now, on the opioid, opioid issue, we're very aware in Congress and are addressing that with legislation to curtail the misuse of opioids, but I, I'm getting both kinds of calls. We we'll obviously we see the abuse of that, and we need to have uh, uh, and legislation we pass this year, if you wish to get more details on it, our office can provide you with that, as I don't have it at my fingertips here, but we're, we're looking for solutions on the opioid abuse, but then I also have a constituent who called, <coughs> excuse me, and can't get the, the the treatment she needs for a back surgery. She's arbitrarily kicked off. She told me about some kind of a, a regional aspect of how much opioids are going to allow by region, 
not on a case-by-case -case basis for the patient. So this is something we'll be looking into as well. There's appropriate use of these of these painkilling medicines for someone who's, like in this lady's case, had a back surgery that uh, really needs the, to have that pain curtailed until she's healed. And so what you're talking about on the essentials, we, we built in essentials into that. It's not exactly the same as the ACA, but you have to remember the bill is a work in progress as the House has certain constraints of what you can send over to the Senate and have the Senate address. So the, the Senate's still wrestling. So right now, the ACA is as is. And when, during the years that President Obama was in there and, and with the Republican majority, they actually was at least seven pieces of legislation to change aspects of the ACA that the President signed. So this is an ongoing thing, no matter what side you're on. Okay, thank you. We're gonna to go to comment. Ma'am, yeah. hand it over and we'll, we'll do that. We'll be glad to take that. Let's take the first comment of two. Hi, my name is Tamara Yates. There's so many things to say, I don't even know where to start. I would like to ask one thing. Stick to data, real data. There are no such thing as alternative facts. When it comes to healthcare, the healthcare you voted for would destroy so many lives in your own constituency. The only one, the only people it would help are people as wealthy as you who would then get a tax break from it. Yep. I'm trying, I'm remaining civil. This is a very serious issue. I have 28 seconds. So my second issue, being a former teacher, is do something about Betsy DeVos. She's destroying our country. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. LaMava. Good morning. My name is Barbara Richmond, and I know that you're a lifelong resident of Butte County. I also know that you have voted several times to roll back environmental regulations. And I just want to remind you that 50 years ago, if it wasn't raining or foggy, you could see Shasta, and you could see uh, Mount Lassen, and in the other direction, you could see the center views on almost any day of the year right here from Chico. And that is not possible today. So I suspect that unlike what you have said, mankind is playing some role in this. Indeed, mankind is preventing forest management that keeps our forests from burning. Maloney! Thank you. Um, I have a question about the Affordable Care Act, and um, as you have suggested, there are, uh, you know, the Senate is not going to pass what the House passed. It doesn't look like that's going anywhere at all. So I was wondering whether you might be willing to sign on to the, uh, what the Problem Solvers Caucus in the House has put forward, which is to essentially keep the architecture of the Affordable Care Act and make some changes. Uh, as we have uh, been doing over the last couple of years, as you suggested, but let's fix the system we have now uh, so that it can serve more. The problem, I think, one of the problems I think that we run into is that as we constantly attack the Affordable Care Act for seven years, insurance companies say, heck, let's get out of this thing. That's why markets are collapsing. <laughs> Hey, thank you for that. I, I'm willing to look at any proposal that makes sense. You know that. So the problem solvers are uh, are crafting something on that, and um, you know we've had all this repeal, replace talk here. So if it's replaced, is it partial replace, partial whatever? It's just the bottom line is what we need is that middle income families are the ones taken at the worst times. Their costs, you know, say six hundred dollars a month of premiums with like a ten thousand dollar deductible. Please, no shouting out. We're trying to have a conversation. So, so this is unaffordable. It means almost like they have no insurance because the deductible is so high they could probably never utilize it, and they're still paying this big nut every month, 600 bucks or more, depending on the size of the family. So if we have, what we have to accomplish it, the other side of all this, is health insurance that's affordable for middle-income families who are paying most of the freight, who are ones that want to have a choice to be in a health insurance system that they can choose from, that has the pieces they want, and incentivize also 
the younger folks, the young invincibles that don't think they need any, right? So if every, every person, every person, every responsible person should be buying their own health insurance, whether it's family, I'm gonna finish. Whether it's, whether it's families, when you reach 18 or 26, whatever the age is, then you're on, there, then you need to be a responsible adult and do, do your own. So with that, let's go back to comments. Good morning, I am Kimberly Candela. I have two things to say. First, I've been living with a rare disease for 33 years. It affects my mobility and other things. I am very fortunate because I have good medical insurance and good medical care. Professionally, I am a lawyer who provides free legal and advocacy services to folks with developmental disabilities. My clients, I serve the same folks you do. I have 8,000 clients, potential clients, over a nine county catchment area from here to the border. And my, I spend my days and evenings in this past weekend, the weekends, advocating for them. I go into schools, I argue with social services agencies, I work really hard to get what my clients need for them. And Medicaid dollars is a huge part of that. And so while I'm doing that, my representative, our representative, is in Washington voting against that. I find that appalling and abhorrent. It's not true. How can you say that? Hi, Doug. Uh, I'd just like to remind you that um, having an abortion is less medically dangerous than childbirth. However, repeatedly, especially uh, last January, you voted to defund abortions. Um, now, clearly, as the beginning of this presentation has shown, uh, separation of church and state is not a big concern of yours, but I'd just like to point out that it's a bit hypocritical uh, for the conservatives to be concerned about uh, Islamic values invading our country, while you yourself are imposing undeniably religiously fueled um, policies onto many women in our country. Yep. Oh, Good morning, Mr. Congress. I'm here on behalf of my girlfriend. She's very upset with your position on Syrian refugees, but unfortunately she can't be here because this was scheduled at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Monday, and she has work. Yeah. Thank you. Coward. Uh, it's very curious to me because your other town halls have been at much more convenient times, either in the morning or on the weekend, and we appreciate that. However, Chico, which has uh, clearly a very large population of people who would like to speak with you, you schedule it at this time. To avoid it, but I'm pretty sure I know what the answer to that would be, so I'm going to ask you this instead. It was on purpose to set a time, yes. <laughs> My question to you is, will you promise me that at some point in 2017, you will have a town hall in Chico at a time where people who work for a living can actually come here? Please? <laughs> Well, I'll remind you, we did have the one in Oroville in April that was at nighttime at the State Theater with 600 people. Yeah. Did you come to that? Yes. Yeah. Your girlfriend come to that? Yes. Yeah. Good. Well, you've been to one. We have 11 counties to serve, okay? We, we also have a full congressional schedule that you do want me in D.C. doing my job, right? No. Not really. Out. All right. So it's a multifaceted job we do here, my staff and I, and so we've always had town halls. We have them based on the geography of the district and need, and uh, as well, I suppose we could have had it at the fairgrounds at four in the afternoon or something, would that have been great, 108 degree weather. So in that sense, we're trying to think of the people that uh, do, do uh, like to go to work from here at nine o'clock or what have you and uh, be able to be part of this. So, People will complain no matter what time you have it. I get complained it wasn't in this town, wasn't in that town. You just got to do the best you can, and you have to realize that we're doing the best we can. So, comments, please. Hello, thank you for having this town hall. Um, I would also like to advocate for comprehensive, affordable health care. And I agree with you that we have to get everybody to sign up for health care. 
And there are a variety of ways of doing that. One of it is to have single payer, so that it's just yes. automatic. Right. There, there are other ways. And please look at, look at whatever works. Um, but I think it's so important that we not allow people to opt out. I was a landlord, and we had a young family that came and lived with us. They'd owned a home. He'd gotten in a car accident. They had thousands of dollars in health care bills and had to sell their house. It ruins lives when people do not have health insurance. We can't rely on just going to the emergency room for those immediate care issues. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Representative Lamalfa. My name is Eileen Robinson, and I'm a member of the Chico Unified School District Board of Education. And I'm also a member of the Tour Shelter um, for the unhoused. I have three issues that I want to comment on, uh, comment on that you have jurisdiction over. At the federal level, funding for um, services in our school districts um, is uh, underfunded in the support for special education, which means we have to bring money out of our local coffers in order to um, provide special education for our students on the issue of the amount of money that the federal government provides for uh, food services in our schools. It is so underfunded that again, we have to subsidize school lunches out of our general fund budget, uh, which encroaches on the, the money that we could use for direct classroom support. And my third issue is single payer health care. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Do great work in the Torres Shelter, man. I appreciate that. Oh, well, that's it. That's it. All right. Yes, yeah, go ahead, sir. I'm worried about how we're treating minorities and immigrants in this country. A lot of historical parallels seem evident to me. We're sending them to detention centers. Um, we're arresting them at courthouses. There's Holocaust survivors in Sacramento telling Sacramento chief mayors that they're wrong set history and they're mirroring the Gestapo. And they're not causing waves of crime. They're not stealing jobs. Like, and that is just like how we've described minorities in the past with parallel histories. And I just wonder if we don't do the right thing, what's going to happen to these people that we're putting in detention centers and not really caring about their legal rights? So my question is, if something negative is occurring in this country, are you going to go along with it or are you going to stop it and do the right thing? Do you want to make that a narrower question? Because I can answer that a million ways. Are you going to make sure immigrants aren't oppressed and potentially deprived of human rights to the point of death? Legal immigrants have every 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 opportunity to be here under the rules of the United States and the uh, the security that our nation is supposed to provide on the border. Okay, I'll give you more time. You want to follow up? These are human beings. They're families. They're not illegals. Understood. Well, if, if you're coming across the border without authorization, then that's illegal. Most of the immigrants uh, visas are expired. Okay, the visa. You, you mentioned the visas. I caught that. So yeah, forty percent of the people that are here illegally have over, overstayed visas. So does the law mean anything? Is the, is the issuing a visa Not to with trust. an expiration date on it, is that supposed to mean something? And so are we to have any kind of order in the country? If you, oh, yeah. you know, if you don't have a border, if you don't have people following rules in that sense, then you really don't have any kind of order. And that makes for all the law-abiding citizens who are paying taxes and doing what they're supposed to do, really wonder, are we supposed to all follow rules or not? So, but fair treatment for people that are immigrating legally, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, good morning. A uh, couple of areas. First of all, uh, universal health care. The United States is the only developed nation on the planet that does not offer universal health care for its citizens. At the same time, Americans pay far more per capita for health for health care with poor, fewer uh, treatment outcomes. Uh, I'm curious to why you think those might be true. Uh, second would have to do with Roundup and glyphosate. Uh, Say it again. It would have to do with a chemical called Roundup, which I imagine as a farmer you're familiar with, 
Uh, there is strong evidence that it is carcinogenic. I'm wondering if, uh, as a congressman, as a farmer, or as one of us, uh, if you have opinions on, or, or the way you might proceed on that. Thank you. We have a couple seconds. Okay, well, Roundup, actually, a high percentage of that is used by homeowners, not farmers. Farmers have to so follow a very strict guideline it? on it that you check the fund. The amount of homeowners using Roundup irresponsibly is huge, so I'm not supposed to comment on comments. But anyway, next comment, please. Climate change will, unless slowed, seriously harm California agriculture. The so-called debate about climate change is not a debate at all. It's overwhelmingly scientific evidence on one side and propaganda from oil, gas, and coal companies on the other side. The companies will lose money when we reduce usage of carbon fuels. If U.S. government doesn't deal with climate change immediately, the land that you and your farmer constituents in this district want to hand down to their descendants could become unfarmable and worthless. There are two sides to this issue. Either you protect big oil, big coal, or you protect agriculture. You've chosen to follow the Republican Party line written by oil and gas and coal interests to get campaign contributions and win elections back east. When you toe the line for the Republican Party bosses, you are selling out California agriculture. Your campaign signs lie. They said he's one of us. You're not one of us. You're one of them. Yeah. this June when I visited your Washington office, um, along with several fellow Citizens Climate Lobby members. Um, with, with what group? Citizens Climate Lobby. Yeah, you met with uh, Mr. Lincoln, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. thank you. I'm sorry yes, I wasn't, we had in, great sorry wasn't in that day. Um, and he, um, he asked some really good questions. Um, I just really appreciate being listened to like that. Absolutely. Um, so what we proposed was a revenue neutral market-based carbon fee and dividend, which would dramatically reduce our carbon emissions and give every US resident a substantial monthly check. A very similar proposal was put forth by the Conservative Climate Leadership Council, which includes James Baker, George Schultz, ExxonMobil, Shelby Key, and General Motors. My question is, now that you've had some time to consider the possibility of a carbon fee and dividend, would you be willing to support it? Who pays the fee? Who's going to pay for the, the dividend? Um, so the fee is levied on um, any carbon fuel that is brought into the country. Um, Rot rotten? No, brought in. Right. Okay. Or any, or at the well, or at the mine. So any carbon fee, once it gets into the economy, they would um, pay a fee based on how much carbon dioxide is produced when the fuel is burned. There's only a few, there's only a few thousand um, entities like that. So it makes it a very simple fee. And then that money does not go into the general fund. What happens to it is it gets redistributed amongst all the people in the U.S. equally. Individuals, not businesses or not uh, for people that need help to. In individuals, every individual. Four, with the, the um, conservative proposal, initially a family of four would receive $2,000 a year. I, I, I appreciate your question and the positive spirit with which you bring that. I think, uh, well, first of all, as a Californian, what we witnessed here in recent weeks was a 12 cent a gallon gas tax increase along with a DMV increase for people's vehicles. And then a cap and trade bill that passed the state legislature recently that over time could be almost 70 cents per gallon of fuel. So I think us as Californians are gonna take a pretty hit on the cost of the doing basic things, whether it's taking our kids to school, going to work, going to have our appointments, whatever it is, on, uh, on our basic mobility. And so as Californians, I'm really afraid what that's gonna mean again to the middle income families that are trying to make it through high cost of health insurance, um, higher tuition costs, put their kids to college if they still hold that dream. And so I'd be very hesitant to levy a fee on the products that people need need to buy. And I don't know, I, I really can't imagine how you can distribute that back to each and every person in the country, but especially the way government administers checks. It costs $25 and 
to process every check, the amount of overhead to run such an organization, I think that I, I would think I would look for a more streamlined way to accomplish these goals of um, fuel efficiency and such. And I think innovation and technology keeps providing for for that. As you know, again, cleaner burning power plants, the whole works. I think we'll accomplish that by advanced technology and the more freedom to do that. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, um, in 2014, there were political scientists from Princeton University and Northwestern that clarified the people power to govern our country. We have no power. Yes. It is governed by money interests. We are an oligarchy. We're no longer a democracy. I don't have questions for you. My comments are for the public, our community. We need to organize by block parties. We need to vote this gentleman out. Yeah. 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 I, I, I am sandwiched between a 91-year-old disabled mother and my brother. I'm dedicating this comment to my brother that died last October. Born with spinal bifida, at age 55 he passed away. If you repeal, you and all the money interests, which is on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, they're both corrupt by money interests. And this proves it. Look it up. That's why I know the is not going to work. Okay, so I'm going to finish saying what I have to say. We're going to move on. We're going to move on. We're going to move on. I was under time on my other time, so I'm averaging up. Thank you. There's a question over here. Thank you. 100% organize and vote the money. Oh, it's fair. It's fair. I represent the Go ahead. Go ahead and start first, and then your time now. Go ahead. First of all, I think that your vote to throw 22 million people off of health care is reprehensible and in the service of rich, I think it's venal. If you need me to explain the word to you, perhaps I can do it. It's venal. And you voted against Planned Parenthood. You voted to close abortion clinics. And frankly, my sincerest wish is that you suffer the same fate as the women. I stop that. No, no I'm, 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 I'm not a nice person. <laughs> I hope you suffer the same painful fate as those millions that you have voted to remove health care from. May you die in pain. <laughs> Pray for our constituents too, sir. <laughs> By the way, it's a Lamalfa, not Lackey. Lackey's an assemblyman in Southern California. <clears throat> Inequality has been getting worse for decades now. The rich continue to do well, really well, while things get worse for every other income group. We're quickly approaching degrees of inequality normally found in developing countries. Despite the administration and your friends and colleagues are intent on cutting taxes for the rich while cutting support services and benefits for the poor, how do you justify continuing to enrich the already wealthy, your friends and colleagues, while cutting services for everyone else? Those are great talking points you get off the internet somewhere. That is a good one. Answer it! The thing I strive for the most Obama was supposed to is opportunities for middle income families, oh, middle income Americans to prosper and continue to live where they would like to live, including the North State. They don't have the option. To continue to live in the North State and have opportunities here. So they don't have to go to a city somewhere, so they don't have to leave where, they're, where they've grown up. 
So I think uh, one of the biggest impediments to that has been the regulatory load that chases jobs out of our country. It all comes back to jobs and economic opportunity here in America. That's what I fight for. That's what I strive for. I really don't give a, a much of a hoot about corporate opinions because corporations tend to be chicken anyway. So, all right? So, you know, we, we hear a lot of talking points on that. I'm not aligned with the rich. I'm aligned with what's opportunity for all Americans. Oh, okay? Are the rich. Are the rich. Liar. <laughs> I'm going to be five minutes late for work, staying to talk to you, so I'm going to be really quick. I'm, I've had to pick one issue to talk about, and the one issue I care most about is environment and climate change. And one thing that I want to point out is your policy that you want to, your, your stance that you want to sell off, have fewer public lands, less public land, will lead to more development of that, which will contribute to climate change, which will contribute to the whole issue of agriculture and all the other all the other climate change issues that we're facing that my daughter and her generation and all of future generations are going to have to face. And um, instead, you should be promoting things like regenerative agriculture. Thank you. Thank you for staying. Good morning, my name is Jim Burfine. I live in Chico, I'm a retired teacher. President Trump has proposed a $9 billion cut to the federal education budget. This will hurt schools, our good schools we have, and students in your district. So you should vote to oppose that $9 billion cut. Yes. Two more points. Vouchers don't belong in either education or health care. Yeah. President Trump and Betsy DeVos are proposing to take the little bit of money they leave in the education budget and put it into vouchers. Vouchers that would be used to increase the profits of their friends' profit-making charter school chains. Paul Ryan has a proposal to use vouchers to replace and, and, and cut Medicare. The vouchers sound like a lot of money. Sometimes they talk about $10,000 or more. But the vouchers won't pay for the Medicare that they cut. So please oppose vouchers in either education or health care. Back over here. In 2016, your, your district CD1, 100,646 people were receiving direct assistance from the Affordable Care Act. When you voted for the HCA bill, that would have given $33,000 tax cut for the top 1% in the first year and $97,000 tax cut for the top one-tenth of 1% one in the first year and cut $32 million from health care coverage and $20 million could die to lack of coverage. As the first gentleman who, who spoke uh, mentioned about the bipartisan group working on legislation that would require the federal government to provide the money for the subsidies for the insurance companies, I would like to know how you would like to uh, vote on that. And also, I would like to have you talk about your support or lack of support of a guaranteed health care for all Americans. All right, thank you. Um, I have not seen a full-fledged proposal from the uh, Problem Solvers Group, but I am open to any ideas. Again, the bottom line to come back to is that the health insurance system we have in this country, we can't ignore it even though you know, the House and Senate couldn't come together on something. The issue is not going away. The costs that are going through the roof for people that pay for this is unbearable for many of them. Middle income Californians, middle income Americans. And so it comes back to giving them choices. If, the, if, that, if that caucus can come up with a proposal, I will look at it and if it comes to a vote, I will give it its due. Because we need not your turn. Because we need to have a solution come out of this. Why don't you join? Not your turn. We need to have a solution that works for the people. We can't ignore it. You know, I, I know it would be irresponsible for me to say, well, let's just keep the ACA as is, and we'll just let the train hit the bridge out of the head. Because you know, as your representative, I see these things. I work with it every day. You know, and so we we'll, we'll fix we'll fix what we can, but it has to be something sustainable. The numbers have to be real. Okay.
Um, I don't know how you guarantee something for every single person, but if we get to a point where everybody, where everybody, if everybody is responsible as a family, and then when they become an adult and buying health insurance and a safety net, like we were talking about a little bit, we'll have a safety net for people that lose their job or go off insurance. We're still providing for that in the discussions on health care. But the safety net can't be permanent. It can't be a, become a hammock. It has to be something that sustains people through to the other side. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Chico. Several years ago, the state of Oregon expanded its Medicare population by lottery. By how much? By lottery. Okay. By chance. Follow-up studies showed that those citizens newly enrolled in Medicaid experienced a dramatic fall in death rates. Your district is predominantly rural. The citizens of District 1 are unusually dependent on Medicaid Medi-Cal for their health, as is the viability of our hospitals and nursing homes. Please explain to us why you voted to drastically reduce federal funding of Medicaid. Comment section, I'm supposed to not do that. But the vote, the vote, my vote was not to do that. The vote had a lot more to it than that. It's more complex and it had several phases. So that isn't what we're trying to do. I, I have to. I have to allow the next person, please. Thank you. Congressman, thank you for being here today. You're welcome, to Chico. Appreciate that. Um, my name is Mike Richmond. I have a podcast called NorCal News Now. Um, so, philosophically, healthcare can be looked at as a an industry, a business a sector, uh, or it can be looked at as a basic human right. Which do you look at it as? <laughs> Rand Paul made a very good comment on no, What are you? So, you have a right to be responsible to uh, take care of you and your family on that. It's not the right of your neighbor to provide for you. It's not the requirement to pay for your right. We're not a jungle. <laughs> I'm willing to help people. I mean, certainly my tax dollars, I think, are well spent. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Same for the military expenditure. Yeah. Everybody above a certain income pays taxes. If you want to pay more, go ahead and voluntarily send more in. Now, next, next comment. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. We tried to jump ahead before, but now it's going to be actually our. Uh, Congressman, thank you for clarifying your position on the, the uh, right of individuals to expect things from the federal government. From 2014, your family partnership received directly almost $5.3 million in rice subsidies. The USDA figures don't include payments that are made to farmers through cooperatives, so there could well be more payments that have not yet been reported. One of the programs that was affected by the 2014 Farm Bill was the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. It's what people generally call food stamps, allows low income people to get vouchers to help pay for food. The bill you voted out of the Agriculture Committee that year threw 2 million poor people off the SNAP program. And while you received 5.3 million in federal crop subsidies from the federal government over the last preceding 20 years, you cited the Bible to support the idea that poor people should not go to the federal government for food support. They should depend on the charity of individuals. Is that your view of the Bible? that wealthy farmers are blessed in getting millions of dollars in the <laughs> The Bible doesn't provide people demand things for the government. The giving comes from the heart. And that was in response to another, another member on that same committee, one time, five years ago, trying to say things that, uh, that uh, using the power of the force of government is the way we should do that. It's Where's come from the heart. Where's it your heart? Charitable yeah. giving on that. And so as far as uh, the farm bill itself, the first farm bill I voted for, I voted to eliminate the direct payments you're talking about because I'm not really a big fan of it either as one of tens of thousands of farmers. Don't accept the 
to finish. I was one of tens, thousands of tens of thousands of farmers. When I graduated college, I came into it, the program was there. I never liked that it was that way. I'd like us to have be independent of the federal government of the farm program, and we're pushing that way. The SNAP program is 80% of the farm bill. The farm part of the farm bill is 20%. The farm part of the farm bill took the largest cut in the last go-round of any government entity when we passed that just a, a couple short years ago. We'll be taking it up again. We've had multiple hearings on the SNAP program. We want to, and I've supported in all the different forms of legislation, the continued funding of it. Well, let's target for the people that really need and really demonstrate the need instead of the fraud and things that go on with that. So that's what we ask. Uh, question, comments? Share to the poor. Yeah. Oh, we're ready? So I just want to say how difficult it is to be polite and cordial in the face of all of the stress that we're facing around losing health care, losing public education, and I'm just really struck with how nice we're supposed to be. Don't bring in our signs. Walk nicely and sit nicely and quietly and try to be polite. And, I, and I'm with you on that. I would love that. But we're really faced with these terrible issues that we have to cope with. And sitting nicely and quietly is very difficult to do. And it doesn't really get across the point. So we are for single payer. We're for public education. We're for feeding the poor. And we want you to help us. So we hear that you're from the middle class, and we appreciate that. We would like your support in keeping Social Security and Medicare for all. We do not want to support the insurance companies, as beautiful people as they are. We will help them find other jobs, and we need medical care, not insurance care. Thank you. Yes. Congressman, uh, thank you for coming to uh, Chico, and thanks for coming and bringing your staff earlier to uh, the Habitat for Humanity opening over on uh, on uh, Pear Street there. Uh, affordable housing is a big deal in the North State. Uh, we're a very poor district, as you know, and housing is growing uh, more expensive. And Butte County, uh, especially in Oroville, 50% of the people are spending more than 50% on their housing income. Uh, that's creating you know, poor communities. Uh, when you go on top of that and do something like cut food stamps for people, uh, now we have kids going to school hungry, uh, we have childhood poverty. I'd like to see you uh, support the tax credits under HUD and uh, Ben Carson to help create more affordable housing here for us in the North State. Uh, also, I think it's absurd that uh, we live in an area where there's 256 Goldilocks days of sunshine and yet we, we're not creating jobs here. The number one jobs right now are in solar energy and wind power. Bird. We need to bring some jobs to this district, and what, however you feel about climate change, those are the facts. Um, well, the sea has risen, uh, but those are the facts. Uh, we can create a lot of jobs here, and I'd like to support a financial trade tax. Uh, and start taxing Wall Street, tax the head bunch, man. Yeah. 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 The key to affordable housing is to make it more affordable. The cost of building a home, the cost of getting a permit to get a home, availability of land, and uh, the high cost of land due to only being able to use a little bit of it because of a fairy shrimp or something, that's what drives the cost of housing. I have one quick comment before I ask my question, and that is that if we didn't spend so much money on military, including $10 million a day to Israel, uh, there would be more money for housing, health care, homeless, all of those things. This is my question. Uh, my question is about the, the Israel Anti-Boycott Act, H.R. 1697, which I'm thinking you are a co-sponsor of. This is a bill that would um, punish U.S. persons participating in the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign for Palestinian rights, which is a global movement, um, nonviolent, calling for Israel only to comply with international law. The penalties for 
uh, supporting the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement would be a minimum of $250,000, a maximum of $1 million. And, oh, okay, I've got to get to the question, which is, this criminalizes um, taking a political position. Do you think it's consistent with American values of free speech? And will you commit to voting against this bill? The, the bill is not in its final form for me to vote on yet, and so I have not, uh, I'm not 100% at this point what I will do, but I am a firm supporter of Israel. They're one of our strongest allies anywhere in the world, and uh, the UN does them no favors. So when you cite international law, uh, they, they, never hard, they hardly ever get a fair shake from the UN or UNESCO. They, they don't even want to uh, acknowledge that there's a, a history of Israel and a Jewish people in Jerusalem or in that country. So it's ridiculous, ridiculous sanctions, ridiculous efforts being done against one of the finest allies you could ever have in Israel coming out. So I will remain a firm ally of them. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Robert Mullins. Uh, my concern is not about health care, but uh, on a different tangent. And it regards two federal laws from 1872. These are federal laws. And it uh, allows for mining on federal lands. Uh, are you aware of where I'm going with this thing? OK. Uh, the, a individual by the name of Reinhardt was dredging on federal properties uh, uh, around Susanville area. When, when was that? Uh, a couple, few years ago. Recently. And uh, there is still uh, pending uh, regulation by the state of California, uh, whereas the state of California Supreme Court ruled that they could uphold a ban on dredging on federal lands, stating that water running through federal uh, properties, BLM, forestry, belong to the state because it goes into the state aquifers. But what they, what they did rule was that uh, a uh, legislator in the state of California brought a bill, Senate Bill 639 or 636, one of those, anyway, which allowed for the dredging. But the regulations had to be drawn up by the Department of uh, Water Resources. Well, the Department of Water Resources is not drawing up any regulations. So it's like a moot point. So why is the... Uh, feds not interceding on this to disavow the state's impediment on federal law. Give, give your name to my staff and we'll get you an answer to that, okay? Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, second comment. Hello. Hi. I think you forget sometimes who you're representing. So never, never do. I, um, I just wanted to let you know who I am and how you can represent me. I'm a nursing student, and by the time I'm done with my education, I'll be over $50,000 in debt. I have oftentimes the only healthcare professional I see is Planned Parenthood or women's health specialist. Without Planned Parenthood, uh, my life would be very, very different. I think uh, a large percentage of the women really, really benefit, and men as well. So please uh, remember me when you're casting your vote. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, Congressman Lamalta. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having a conversation with us. Glad to hear that you have an open mind and willing to consider alternatives. Uh, unfortunately, some of the alternative facts we've heard here today make me worry about that. So what I'd like to do is ask a question about taxes. That's the next major issue that Congress will uh, undertake is tax reform. As we go through tax reform, I hope you keep in mind that there's absolutely no evidence that tax cuts pay for themselves. There's no evidence that tax cuts for the wealthiest 10% of the economy will stimulate growth. 
and there is evidence that tax cuts for the wealthy increase economic inequality, which is a huge issue in this country. So my question is, as, we, as Congress considers tax reform, will you please commit to us not to decrease, at a very minimum, don't decrease taxes on the wealthiest 10%? That's the question. I'm going to look at it as a broad spectrum. Now, when you, when you talk about uh, when you talk about who are the wealthiest, or who are we talking corporations? Are we talking about uh, high income? You know, look, here's, a, here's a fact too. Every dollar earned by an individual, they earn, not the government, not their neighbor. Those are their dollars. So how much is we supposed to take? Some people would say, I saw somebody commenting, they take 90% from a high income earner. What's the incentive? You know the story of the little red hen. What's the incentive to do anything in this country? That's why jobs and, and corporations go overseas. We have over two trillion dollars. This is a this is a bipartisan thought here. Uh, no, it's Mr. not. Mr. Delaney, I just saw Mr. Delaney from Virginia last night, a Democrat member, talking about a way to bring dollars back into the country by reducing the tax rate for those folks that have money swirled over there to bring the jobs here, to bring the manufacturing here, to bring the, the business here, and we'll put that money into infrastructure. So there's an interesting bipartisan idea right there, but not going back after this envy or anger at people that have earned something. So That's bullshit. Tax, so in our, tax reform, in our tax reform, we want to stimulate, not the government doing the stimulating, but the people seeing a set of rules, a set of policies that gives them confidence that they invest in the U.S. by building a factory, building an automobile plant, automobile plant, whatever, they'll be able to do that for 30 years, because that's a large investment, and be able to recoup that, employ people, pay taxes in the U.S. That is where we want to go with this thing. And so, but the idea that, um, because the government believes that it already owns the, your income, and that's the attitude of it. I can't hear the comment over here, please. I had to get back in line. Uh, number one, number one, you keep going on about middle income families, but almost a quarter of the population in your district is living below the poverty line, so what does that do for them? Number two, I saw a lot of red flags for that one guy, but I live with a very painful chronic, uh, chronic illness, and may I just say that I don't speak for all disabled people, but I personally would very much like to see you and any other uh, politician who stands uh, who stands working with a president that openly mocks disabilities to experience this up close and personal, because maybe it will shock a little compassion into your soul. And number three, please resign. I know you won't listen to me on this one, but please, just go away. <laughs> Mr. Lamalfa, it takes a lot of guts to come and uh, face us all, and for that, uh, at least I admire you. Uh, Mr. Malta, I would, for us, huh? I would really appreciate it if you would stop making me pray to Jesus. I feel like you are, yeah. really, I mean, if you just said, implications are dicey enough. When I was at Oroville, they did the same thing. Now, I do not see you getting preachers who rotate through in the name of Jesus, in the name of Mohammed, in the name of Buddha. In the, that, that might be okay, but it's consistently in the name of Jesus. And if you can't get people to give the invocation who have the intelligence and sensitivity to know when they have crossed that line, I feel like you are advocating a state religion. I don't want to pray to Jesus at town hall meetings. Please stop it. Pick your education givers a little more carefully. Thank you. Well, I won't be stopping that, but if you want to have your own town hall, you can pray whoever you like. Yes. Hey, 
I just spent three years as a full-time caregiver for my husband, who passed away in March. Um, most women do their caregiving on the other end, although a lot of us do it on both ends, taking care of children. And what I want to know is, what are you going to do to get Social Security for unpaid caregivers? We suffer a lot when it goes to getting our Social Security because we've killed three years of our productive time. You mean that in that you're uh, not, that's time loss of paying into Social Security, you would have had it in an occupation, but uh, not during that time. college before, and that's, you know, my best paying years. Okay, okay, that, that's quite a quandary there. I, uh, I, uh, I, I ask you to uh, uh, put that in a form, send that to my office for something that we can actually go through a formal process and look at that because I'm not a social security expert, but I do know that uh, somewhere in the 2030s we're gonna be in pretty big trouble on that because social security is uh, not solvent as, as it is. Baloney. So, so we want to do everything we can to, uh, to save the system. You know, Medicare similarly. Medicare is supposed to be self-sustaining, but when it got rolled into the ACA, it puts that into peril as well. But uh, Social Security Stop stealing money from Medicare. reform to make it long-term sustainable instead of running out in the 2030s is something we must do. And in, in, your as, in your aspect of that, I'd like to see how that how we can fold that into the discussion. But I, I don't have an idea for you on that right now because uh, that, that's really something kind of new in my uh, view there. So please please put that on paper for us, and maybe when we see up at Plumas, we'll uh, we'll have a little more. Long answer on that. What town are you from in Plumas, ma'am? If you care to disclose. Chester. Chester? Okay. We have a really good chance we'll see you there. Okay. How the government pay back what they borrowed from Social Security? They don't have the money. Yeah. Nobody does. I'll thank you also for being here. It's not easy. And it's also not easy to speak truth to power. Pay for money. I am proud to pay my taxes. I believe it's patriotic to pay taxes. Right. I'm right. lucky enough that I get to pay taxes because I did well in my job and have good retirement. I was most disturbed by your comments that it's not our job as a community to take care of those less than us. I believe... I did not say it that way. I said it's not yes, the force of did. government. Not the force of government. We are government. See, I do take care, I do charitable donations as well. But the reason I don't fight paying my taxes is because I do support, I have no children of my own, but I support public education. My house hasn't burned down, but I support the fire department. More importantly, I want to support those that are not as lucky as I. There are many people not able to get a job. And so I'm proud American paying my taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Huh, too bad you don't have it. I would like to correct something you said about the United Nations not supporting Israel and by reading something from the uh, Jewish website for the history of the Jewish state. The, uh, on the 29th of November 1947, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in Ersatz Israel. The General Assembly required the inhabitants of Ersatz Israel to take such steps as were necessary on their part for the implementation of that resolution. This recognition by the United Nations of the right of the Jewish people to establish their state is irrevocable. So the United Nations has supported Israel and has on many occasions come to their support both militarily and economically. You on top of that, the UN looked a lot different 70 years ago than it does now. But it's irrevocable no, and they still, yes, okay. Now, on top of that, I'd just like to make the comment that um, it might do you well to just reflect that a lot of people who may have voted for you last time or may have voted for you in the past are now concerned because you have, in their eyes and in my eyes and in many people's eyes, become a Trump man and a company man of the Republican line. <laughs> We want you to be the Northern California representative first and foremost, and that's what we will vote for, someone who promises to be that and not the adherent 
to someone or some uh, a party over and above the needs of your constituents. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, for that, I don't answer to a party. I don't answer to an individual. Oh! You were raised wrong. Northern California, and to <laughs> 750,000 constituents that we serve in this district. So we have about 500 here today, 400. So we'll keep, continue to go out and see them. How are we doing on the time there, sir? 905. All right. Let's take one more question over here. Uh, good morning, sir. I appreciate the enormous challenges and difficult issues you face as a member of Congress. However, <laughs> along with many Americans and backed by scientific consensus, and convinced that rapid climate change caused primarily by the combustion of fossil fuels is the most significant issue facing this country, the world, and all living things, and that the costs of taking action are far, far less than the cost of doing nothing. Personally, I've followed the science for 25 years and have watched uncertainty become certainty and hypothesis become direct observation. Will you, Congressman Lamalva, like 26 fellow Republicans, join the bipartisan House Climate Solutions Caucus whose purpose is to serve as an organization to educate members on economically viable options to reduce climate risk and protect our nation's economy, security, infrastructure, agriculture, water supply, and public safety, or at least support the House Republican Climate Resolution. Thank you. I will, I will gear towards positive economic as well as environmental solutions that strengthen the U.S.'s ability to innovate, to produce cleaner burning equipment, power plants, all the things across the board that would be a concern. I do not buy the idea that, uh, that man-made activity is responsible for it. Idiot! Pull your head out of the sand! No, you're an idiot! Hey, for whatever percentage it may be, we address that. Huh? Again, the all the time, we have the great power, global the warming innovation. <laughs> we'll come out with cleaner burning, oh, yeah, cleaner burning power plants. We're going to do better because we're an industrialized nation. So, solar to, our, to just merely tax ourselves and hand the money over to the government so they can build silliness like high speed rail. What does that have to do with so solar? Very little or nothing to help any kind of uh, CO2 activity. Okay? Nice. Two over here, and then we're going to wrap it up. My name is Mike Greer. I'm a union president. Sorry, Mike Greer. I'm a union president for CTA. And I want to thank you for co-signing the Rural Schools Author Reauthorization Act so that our schools up in Plumas County, our schools in Butte County, in the rural areas, do get money from the government. I appreciate that. I'd like to ask you to take a close look at the WEP and GPO, which is the Social Security Windfall Tax Act, so that our teachers, whose uh, significant others receive Social Security, that they'll be able to receive that if they happen to die. We have a lady here in town that taught, and during, when she was older, she taught for about five years, received a CTA pension. Her husband paid Social Security. He passed away. She got none of his Social Security. I'd like to have you take a look at it. And ask you to go ahead and appreciate that. Submit that to us. I will get with your staff. It'll be part of the Social Security discussion. I, I think you're right on that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sir. Sure. My name is Tom Mound, and I want to thank you, Congressman Lamalfa, for coming, for the courage and the patience you've shown. Um, this takes a lot of guts to, uh, to face the ground, and it represents a lot of different opinions. We lament the level of discord in our body politic nationally. We should do something about it here at the local level and not fuel the flames, but find a different way to discuss our differences, our very real differences on these emotion fraud issues. Congressman LaMalfa, represents uh, a way of looking at government and how we should uh, do things in this nation. Those who disagree can elect a different representative. But the, but the point is, he represents tens of thousands of people who agree with this, this approach to government. 
And, uh, and I'm proud to have him as my congressman. And if you're not, that's fine. But, um, but this, is, this is part of the greatness of our Republican form of government. So, thank you. Thank you. Oh, don't end on that. All right, well, folks, we have uh, we've got over we've got over our time. I want to do a little extra here and such, but uh, I do thank you for your gathering and for your thoughts. Uh, we have we have comment cards you can make out there as well. We look at those and we will uh, use that in our decision making process. So uh, please submit those if you wish. But uh, you know, I, I do. Yeah, we have a, we have a discussion here. We have some differences of opinion. A lot of them. There's a lot of people not here today that probably have different opinions too. So we look at all that. <laughs> but a like constructive Trump. conversation is one that we can all hear each other better for. It. So y'all did pretty good today. I'll be okay, right? Okay. All right. Very smart. You know what that does? You know what that does? And it incentivizes me to say we can keep doing these because we're going to have constructive conversations. All right. So we will do more. So thank you for coming.